honor to be with each and every one of you this morning and engaging in this much needed conversation. So let's get started, shall we? So we have our, our amazing panelists, our first question that we want to kind of dive into. What kind of online activism have you personally been involved in and what led you to this involvement? Anyone can start. Um, I'll take this one, I'll start with this one. So I think the first time that I really saw online activism was the 2008 um, Barack Obama campaign. But at the time I was in high school and I didn't really see it as activism. I just saw it as conversations that were happening. Um, but I think a lot of us in this room know that social media was really pivotal in his 2008 campaign, also in his later campaign. Um, but that was the first time that I really saw people talking about politics on social media in a really effective way. And I remember at my school, I went to a predominantly white school, and I planned this whole um, like watch party basically for the campaign and a bunch of people came, it was really exciting. I went to a pretty liberal school, but we didn't have a, a black grad or a black student union or anything like that. But all the black kids came and it became kind of like this party. And at the time I definitely didn't think of it as activism um, or building community or anything like that. I thought of it as like a survival, uh, survival tactic. It was something that I did because I didn't have anyone to watch this with. It was something that I did because it was a really pivotal event in my life and I wanted it to be remembered. Um, and I think with youth in general, they don't see a lot of what they're doing as activism, they see it as survival tactics. Um, and that was kind of the first time I remember seeing it online. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Um, can you repeat the question? Yeah, <laughs> I was like so involved. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. So what kind of online activism have you personally been involved yeah. in and what led you to this involvement? Yeah, so I guess I can talk about Collective Blue. <laughs> um, well, I guess, and Misfits. So Collective Blue is a lifestyle brand that I started with a co-founder, um, and our goal is highlighting creatives of color, and we do that through digital storytelling and event production. And for us, digital storytelling, kind of like what Kiana said, um, we didn't originally see it as an act of activism or trying to change the narrative it was more of like we're frustrated we want to start highlighting our peers and the work they're doing and give them opportunities to be seen give them opportunities to profit from their creative work um, so we started that in the, or around the end of 2012 and that's rolled into a lot of other types of activism where um, you know for uh, we recently did a campaign with Maria Oliveira. She's an undocumented immigrant and entrepreneur. Um, and this was during the midterms. Um, and we pushed, we helped to push out her like voter's guide. Um, and I think it's becoming a little bit more political too in the way that we engage with our storytelling. Yeah, thank you. Oh God, you guys have given some really good responses and I'm like, okay, what have I done? Okay. <laughs> um, so I remember being on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook, Instagram is the only social media I currently use, but um, I remember being on Facebook when Facebook just came out. So um, what was that like some time ago? <laughs> um, and I remember like I would post I used to travel a lot, um, especially throughout Africa, and I'd post pictures. And um, I had a lot of uh, white friends who used to travel throughout Africa and have like a lot of white savior mentality, posting in orphanages or whatever. But when I would post, I would just like post photos of the people in their everyday lives. That was really important to me. And um, a lot of my white friends would comment um, with very, uh, deficit views uh, comments, like, uh, where can we donate, or we want to help, blah, blah, blah. And um, I would then form conversations from those comments, like, what makes you think this? Why do you think they need help? Uh, what do you see when you view this image? So I remember very early on, I didn't think of it as activism, but I thought of it as how can I show people's everyday lives and bring value to it um, and kind of um, change how the narrative that people have of countries in Africa and 
Yeah. Yeah, and I would piggyback off of that because that was my introduction into activism, and I didn't know what I was doing really in 2011, but uh, my family's from Ethiopia. They're immigrant parents, and I'm a first-generation American born in Dallas, Texas. So I grew up uh, very embarrassed and ashamed of where I came from due to infomercials that were always portraying negativity on Ethiopia and the continent of Africa. So I would get made fun of in school and I was always shying away and I never felt American enough, I never felt African enough. So I was always kind of misplaced and never feeling really connected to anything. And I, in 2011, I remember walking out of a movie and it was the first inspiring movie on Africa. It was called Black Gold. It was a documentary about uh, coffee farmers. I thought it was very interesting and I was like, wow, this is something so rich that comes from the continent that I'm not used to uh, seeing on, on TV. Uh, so I remember telling my friends, I want to go back and, and, and learn and, 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 and show more um, positive stories because I grew up watching myself uh, in poverty because of the infomercials, the 10 cents a day commercials. And though they had maybe some of their, its own agendas and what they were trying to do, the images that were always, that I was always being bombarded with affected me greatly. So I grew up watching myself in poverty. I grew up watching myself, you know, uh, uh, you know, struggling constantly with these images. And I never really saw myself be empowered. So I realized that if I cannot wait for people to create the type of content that I need to see. So immediately in 2011, I started raising funds. This was before Kickstarter. I went on YouTube, just put the camera up, had some lamps, uh, just old fashioned. I said, hey guys, my name is Nate. I told my story. I said, hey, I'm trying to go to Ethiopia and I want to share positive stories. I, I want to sh share a different side of things. So that's what I did. And I took a trip to Ethiopia with a couple, a couple of my closest friends. Uh, we had people mail us money, I remember, to a P.O. box in South Central LA. There was nothing digital, like no, you know, it was just, no no Venmo, nothing. I remember that. But when I went to Ethiopia, the white savior complex, I didn't want to go in with that or the diaspora complex. I wanted to go in as a as someone that's willing to learn and walk alongside people in their journey and give them a platform to share their own story as is. And there's a, a quote that I always remember that says, when the lion, um, uh, when the lion uh, learns how to write, uh, until the lion learns how to write, every story will glorify the hunter. So that was my really introduction to activism and understanding that I have to write my own story in order for it to be seen. So thank you for sharing that. Second question, what issues and conversations appear to be resonating among young people of color? There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. With, with your own personal lives and initiatives, kind of what you've been noticing within your own sphere. Well, to piggyback a little bit off of what you were talking about, um, representation. And that comes in so many different forms. Um, and I don't just mean on TV or in the movies, um, but representation in politics or representation, people that look like me um, that go to college, people that look like me that go into politics, people that look like me that are in positions of power. Um, that's something that I didn't necessarily see growing up. I saw a lot of people that looked like me, people that looked like my dad um, in athletics, um, things like that. And I think that when you see that for so long, you kind of start to think that this is what I'm capable of and this is what I'm expected to do. So um, something that I've always been really passionate about is mentorship and talking to other students of color and letting them know that they are capable of things that they don't necessarily see themselves represented in. Um, one of the main reasons that I went to graduate school was because I had a professor that basically told me that I was capable and that I, I could do it if I wanted to. Um, so for me, I think representation in, in several areas, um, but especially in, uh, in education has been important to me. I would say that for me personally, um, representation too, and I think that um, I'm championing it in a lot of ways in my life without maybe connecting the dots until fairly recently. So I also freelance as a portrait photographer. And after a while, I noticed something consistent in my work is that I'm really passionate about shooting with women of color and being able to portray them in, you know, in what is considered beautiful. Because I feel like in that sense, photography, content, 
Um, the storytellers aren't necessarily women of color either, so it's difficult to be able to capture that essence, or it's not as common. So in that area of my life, um, I fight for representation, and also with uh, recently, um, through Collective Blue and in collaboration um, with our friend Christina of Inbold Company, which is, is an online journal for women of color, um, we produced a festival on February 10th, a couple weekends ago, called Misfits Fest. And the goal was to celebrate Asian American women and entrepreneurship in the arts. And that came from doing Collective Blue work, um, championing for people in this space, and realizing like we ourselves as two immigrant Asian American women like we ourselves are not represented in the fields of entrepreneurship and the arts. So um, we put together like a 300 plus person festival where there was comedy, where there was panels talking about, you know, how to tell your parents you're not a doctor, engineer, lawyer, pursuing creative roots. Right. Like, um, you know, um, so, and something to that kind of related back and that we've talked about is, um, my goal for that was if like 18 year old college Nina, college freshman Nina walked into that space and was like, oh, there's someone who looks like me that's DJing, that's a tech founder, that's, you know, a craft like jewelry vendor, that's openly advocating for mental health in the public policy space. Like that would have just broadened the narrative of what I could be and how impactful that it would have been. What was the question again? Yeah, so what issues and conversations appear to be resonating among young uh, people of color? Okay, I want you to go with me with this answer, but I think what I'm noticing a lot with young people is how they can push the singular narrative that is often um, pushed on them um, to show how dynamic people can be. So um, the idea that blackness doesn't look one way, um, being a woman doesn't look one way, um, that uh, sexuality is all over the place. Like I think uh, that self-care doesn't look one way or activism doesn't look one way. So um, proving that these concepts are seemingly simple but um, not monolithic at all. And I think um, that is something that is very powerful um, that is happening right now because it also shows that um, activism isn't just like a state of arriving or being, but it can be a walking contradiction. For example, that like I really like trap music, but there are some very problematic things in those lyrics. So it's just like, Yes, I identify as someone who has feminist tendencies, but I can also be this, this, this. So I think showing how the lines can get blurry and own right. that. Right, right. I just wanted to speak to your point of um, activism doesn't look one specific way. And I think that's really important, especially in with the idea that there is this the sense of clicktivism where people just kind of um, spend minimal or low effort in their forms of activism. But being here, I think, is a form of activism. Talking about things with your friends, um, confronting people, that's a form of activism. When you're online, on Twitter, and um, you respond to a tweet that you, you don't agree with, like there are so many different forms of activism and ways to involve yourself in, in that form of activism. Um, and I think young people especially have been able to do this in really, really innovative ways. And one, one example that always comes to mind that is kind of funny. Um, so, so I did a lot of my research on Twitter, uh, black Twitter specifically. And there is this one trending hashtag that was uh, hashtag my NYPD. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but basically the New York Police Department tried to do this like campaign where you use the hashtag MyNYPD to show all of your great experiences with the New York Police Department. And Black Twitter was like, okay, this is fun. Uh, so what they started doing was they made this a trending hashtag with all the different times, the various brutal photos of police department's interactions with citizens. And it was kind of thing done in a funny way, um, but it was kind of using this humor and this pain to make a statement. And that's a form of activism. Um, it's changing the narrative. It's taking something that is usually seen through one lens and um, 
and making sure people know the truth behind me, behind it, or at least see it through your eyes. So yeah, I just wanted to have a little tidbit on, on what activism is, because it's not just showing up to a women's march. Um, there are so many ways to involve yourself in activism, and I think the youth especially, because they're so prevalent on social media, have done this in really, really innovative and meaningful ways. Yeah, no, great, great addition. So how does social media uh, play a role as far as helping improve uh, participation and collaboration within activist, activist movements? <laughs> Take a one this, is, this is like really early in the morning for this question. Well, I can, I, can, I can give a recent example as in a few days ago. Um, I think that social media takes down geographic barriers and catalyze the population that you can access as well the speed in which that can happen. So an example is with our Misfits account, you know, I think we were just using some, t we were just using like representation matters, Asian American female creatives or something like that. And we ended up getting connected with um, a bunch of other female Asian American organizations trying to push for change too. And one of them was in New York. So it's like, out of social media on Instagram, we connect with this organization, we exchange emails on Instagram. Over email, we're like, let's set up a Google Hangout. We set up a Google Hangout and we end up you know, these are like complete strangers that are con we connected with um, and we ended up having really amazing conversations about the type of work we're doing in our own cities and now we're talking about potentially collaborating on like an open source um, project that's like putting Asian American creatives on the map. So allowing people to collect vendors in their city and like create this digital map that starts in Austin, New York and then spans across. And that would never have happened without the without the use of social media. Um, can I get technical with y'all for a minute? <laughs> so in my research at UT, um, basically what I found, I used this crazy methodology called uh, critical technoculture discourse analysis. So I'll break it down really quickly. Discourse analysis is basically um, the tweets that, it was the discourse, the tweets that I was looking at. Uh, critical technoculture was basically looking at why people are tweeting that, but then also looking at the platform that they were using. So in this case, it was Twitter. So basically uh, what I found was black people flocked to Twitter for various reasons. Uh, one being socioeconomic reasons. Um, a lot of black students, kids, um, when Twitter was first coming up on the scene, didn't have access to laptops. They had phones. They had uh, mobile phones at higher rates than uh, white kids. Um, Asian kids and Hispanic kids. So Twitter, the affordances of Twitter, the fact that Twitter was mostly a mobile um, platform at the time meant that a lot of black kids were on there. So a lot of the things that they were talking about, this is kind of why black Twitter, black Twitter became a thing um, because Twitter was a mobile phone platform, but also um, because they had hashtags on there. You're able to find out about events um, at certain times. And then there was the, the killing of Michael Brown and Ferguson and Black Lives Matter. All of these things were kind of happening at the same time and it was this big, um, all of these, th these things kind of came together and made it a space that black people were really able to thrive on and communicate with each other. So I think it's important to think about not only why people are using it, but these platforms and what they are doing um, to make that accessible to people. And I don't think Twitter or Facebook, they didn't come, they did not arrive so they could become activist platforms. That's not what happened. But people were able to use whatever resources they had and turn it into something. And I think that's really powerful. Um, I think one thing to recognize is the space that this conference is at at UT and how um, it often marginalizes certain people and um, it just the demographics of how um, people of color, uh, people uh, who are on a range of sexuality spaces and ranges could feel at UT. So I know when I first moved to Austin, Instagram became very important to me to curate the life that I wanted to see for myself. 
Um, and I think that's what social media can do, especially if you think about the hashtag Black Girl Magic, um, how that was born and the Afrofuturism behind that, um, the fact that certain people cannot see themselves the way they want to see themselves in the everyday, so they have to create that space social on social media so they can figure out how to get there. And I think um, thinking about social media in that way and then pushing it to making it go from digital to IRL and community organizing is a way that people use social media not just for activism but for healing and for them to go into each other. Um, so I think that's important. And there's also been a lot of research that has found that people that are more active um, online in any type of political movement or social activism are actually more inclined to vote. They're more inclined to go to rallies. They're more inclined to create spaces for people. So it's not just I'm online and I'm tweeting about this. The people that are tweeting about these things are more inclined to actually create real tangible change. And I think that's important to note as well. One more thing. Um, <laughs> with that, I think um, re recognizing again that we are in a privileged space um, at the Academy, but there are many stories and voices that don't um, get shared that they have not been to UT or Weber. Um, for example, I had my pre-service teachers, that means teachers, students who are learning how to be teachers, um, look at tweets from um, celebrities and political figures like uh, Cardi B and AOC and so on, so on, um, and talk about are these people's stories just as important as your professors? Why? Yeah. Why not? And there was a debate. Well, I don't like the way Cardi B speaks. Like, she doesn't speak correctly. What does that mean? Like, what does that mean? And the fact that, again, social media can be used for uh, celebrities or whoever, like Cardi B, who did not, who are not in this space and can still impact change. Right, right. So I think that's something we have to think about. Yeah, that's a good point. And even as a recent, Cardi B has been sharing some, some you know, strong opinions about her political stances as well. And that's generated some a wide array of conversation you know, based on people questioning her authority on these subject matters or people supporting her saying that she's more than an artist. You know, we see that with sports entertainers all the time, you know, that speak outside about things that are socially and politically impacting our culture and community. So uh, participatory uh, politics, I think, uh, Keanu, you were mentioning something along those lines, but can allow for greater uh, creativity and voice, but uh, voice may not necessarily lead to influence. So uh, what sort of shift must occur in order to, for these practices uh, to become influential? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I really love the idea of participatory politics. Um, I think it's something that has existed for generations and it's kind of seen a shift with the emergence of social media. Um, and I think that as far as moving forward um, and like the racism that we see, the sexism that we see, the homophobia that we see, um, it's always going to be a slow moving process. I don't think that social media is necessarily going to make it like happen tomorrow or happen any faster. But I think there's always, there has to be key people that are doing the work. And um, I think the fact that we are seeing people doing the work now, like we're not just seeing it, um, on television when a march happens or whatever, we're seeing them do that work every single day in and out. I think we just need those key players to keep doing the work. People like you, people like you, people like you, to have these conversations, to have a panel like this. Um, I think that slowly over time, these small things will make a difference. Yeah. I think that, um, I think when more people start to step out of themselves on social media, we will see uh, we'll see more progress, and I think that is part of the politics. Like, uh, for example, uh, for Black History Month, I got so many messages uh, asking if I wanted to participate in things, and I said no because uh, I am this way 365 days of the year, so you could see me uh, and talk to me 
um, not just on the shortest month, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but thinking about that, and I think when people um, let go of the commercialism of um, change and women's empowerment and uh, the word ally and um, empowering, I think if people can see those words and concepts come to life in the everyday and think about um, how those everyday things can be shared on social media in small ways, um, I think it will make a uh, big change. Um, so I think, when I think about um, the politics of change, I think about it as there is no neutrality and your neutrality is not the change. You have to actually be active in this every day. So, um, like I tell my students, because they're always like, I'm an ally, I'm an ally. And I'm like, no you're not, no you're not. Because <laughs> at the end of every day, your ally, your ally ship is like a card and it runs out and then the next day you have to wake up and you have to renew it based off of what you do. And I think if people think about it as not as a state of like arriving, but like <laughs> everything I do, um, and how can I use my power to um, help others, I think that is where the change will be. <laughs> right. Yeah, and just picking back what like everyone just said, it's taking these like high level concepts on the macro level and bring it down to the micro level in terms of you know your everyday lives your everyday decisions like engaging in an uncomfortable like conversation with someone like that that is activism like you just said um and so i think it's like there's there's a there's a tendency for like huge you know events like the women's march or like midterm elections to be this rallying you know nucleus virtually and in real life for change to happen but those are but um i think it's important to expand beyond these like big blips and remember that change happens like every day on a small one-to-one -one interaction and i just want to say a quick thing about black history month so i just remember growing up martin luther king was always kind of taught to you as this black Jesus that died to like save all of white people's sins. <laughs> That's kind of how he was taught. And it wasn't, first of all, he did not die, he was murdered. Um, that's not something that you really learn. Like you kind of learn it, but they kind of dance around it. And I think a lot of what I learned growing up, I had to unlearn when I was in college. I had to unlearn when I was in graduate school. And a lot of that unlearning was done on social media. It was done because of Twitter. It was done because of Tumblr. It was done um, on all of these online platforms that I didn't have access to um, because they didn't exist when I was a kid. So I think a lot of the things that we are taught and was kind of embedded in American society, um, kids are having access to that at an earlier age now. Like the internet has basically been de democratized in a lot of ways. And so I think that's really important um, because the things that you learn in school aren't always the things that you should be learning. And now we have access to you know, various amounts of information and knowledge that America might not necessarily want us to have. And so I think that's also important. Yeah, yeah. So when we look at what we do as individuals on a community, uh, within the community, there's also, you know, big entities and industry actors uh, that also can participate. So uh, mediums like Facebook or Twitter, you know, uh, what what do you think they should be able to do in order to um, increase civic engagement? Um, <laughs> well, I think, like I, we kind of talked about earlier, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they're not here so we can have a voice in new and meaningful ways. Um, they don't really care. They just want to make money. So I think there's definitely things that they could be doing. Do I expect that them to do it? Not necessarily. Um, I think that a lot of their algorithmic changes have, um, have mirrored a lot of hierarchy that's offline. So I've tried to create an Instagram and a Twitter where um, I feel represented there. 
So I will unfollow, like they might say, oh, you should follow this person because you're into fashion. I'm like, I don't want my feed to be all very skinny white women. You know, so there's a lot of things that they have embedded in their, algor uh, in their algorithms and stuff that would make me feel less represented. Yeah. Um, and I think there's some education that needs to happen there also around people really curating a feed that makes themselves feel good or curating a space that makes themselves feel good that the platform doesn't necessarily take into consideration when you sign up to these platforms. I don't think large corporations should have a role in you know, curating civic engagement. Mm -hmm. I think their goal is to remain neutral, police anything that's like illegal, but it's up to the individual responsibility to curate our, for ourselves. But do you think that, like with their algorithm, yeah. do you think it is neutral? It's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's not neutral. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that we can be aware of. Um, and curate for ourselves, but yeah, like I, on the larger picture, like I don't think I would feel comfortable with corporations mm -hmm. curating, yeah, yeah, my belief system. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here's a question I want to ask. So we all know sexual harassment, police brutality, uh, wealth inequality, media representation, and various other issues that affect oppressed communities are not new issues. Uh, so what forms of technology have you found that have elevated these conversations in pertinent ways? Um, I would just say the first thing that comes to mind is um, the prominence of video and uh, your mobile phone having video sharing capabilities. So obviously my, my thesis did a lot with um, Black Lives Matter but what I found most striking about my research is all of the video coverage, all of the citizen-generated content um, that was created. A lot of what was used in these stories was not something created by the news media. Um, it was completely created by citizens. So people were taking out their phones, recording things. We see young people doing this all the time. I do this all the time. I see something happening, I take out my phone. It's like, world star. But, <laughs> But there's also an important thing that's happening here. We are documenting um, things that have not been documented before. We are documenting things that have been hidden from mainstream, um, yeah, mainstream audiences. Um, a lot of white people have not ever had to confront police brutality. They've never had to confront a lot of these things that we are shoving in their face now because we have the video backed evidence or video evidence to back it up. And I think that's really, really important. So when people take out their phones and they're, you know, it's kind of become a part of young people's culture to have their phone out all the time, to record things all the time. There's Snapchat, there's so many ways to record. Um, but there's something also going on there. We're recording things because we don't feel rep represented. We are taking pictures because we don't feel represented. We are posting these things because the narrative has never been through our lens. I think about uh, just what you're saying, Kiana, but also how cell phone and social media usage has peaked as a form of safety. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking about when I used to teach third grade and we talked about like Mike Brown and Trayvon Martin and talked about like the feelings connected to that. And I taught, um, my classroom was like 99% black and I don't know why one of the kids had to say this, but he was like, do you know I'm black? And I'm like, yes, I do. And he was like, do you know Mike Brown was black? And like, he was making these connections. And I'm like, yes. And he's like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a phone. Like he said, he's like, I gotta get a phone. And at that age already, his mom was teaching him how to respond to the police. Um, what do you do? Um, why can't I wear a hoodie? Things like this. Mm -hmm. Third grade that his maybe white counterparts don't even have to think about. So when you think about it in that way, it's like the cell phone and social media become safety, but it's also daunting to think that we're asking certain children to grow up and police themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, at an earlier age because they are learning that this is not safe for them right. and it becomes a tool yeah. 
for their safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I, I agree 110%, especially with like police officers. I remember growing up just being afraid. Just I'll be in a restaurant and I'll see them eating and I feel afraid. And I dealt with that trauma because of all the images that I was in. Maybe I never really, and at that point, I never really had any you know, personal interactions, but because of what I've been fed and what I've seen through friends that have been dealt with in, in hurtful ways, it turned into trauma and how I look at and perceive them. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's um, some, someone said once that, you know, anything that's suppressed can be harmful to you as well, because it's one thing going through trauma. It's the next thing to try to articulate how you feel. And then, then trying to be able to really um, architect what this needs to look like for your life within this country in this context you know so there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there but I wanted to give some opportunities for y'all to ask questions right now I know we have a little less than 10 minutes so I want to honor the time so uh, this has been a wealth of information and conversation so it's it was great but I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to kind of ask any questions uh, do I have any questions right over here? Can you also say your name so that everybody knows and where you're from and then ask the question? Why are you trying to put me on spot like this? <laughs> you know, because we from North Texas. I know oh, you. Okay, yeah, I see how it is. Uh, my name is Amanda. I'm from Arlington, but I live in San Antonio now. Um, I'm a social media manager by day, um, and I also have to be blessed by being a biological female of color. <laughs> I work with plenty of clients, and I see plenty of brands that do things that are was no one in the room that said this was bad? <laughs> was there just no one in anywhere that said this was bad? And I admit personally, because I have a lot of dogs in various courts, the feminism court, the LGBTQ court, like I have a lot of balls in those courts, I have a very, very hard time articulating and balancing tone. Mm -hmm. And it comes off a lot of just screeching. Mm -hmm. And I know my clients don't respond well to that when it's just, well, why can't we do this? No. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice on one brand responsibility and then two balancing tone because I know I struggle with the angry black woman mm -hmm. That is definitely something that has been lobbed at my way to sort of you know <laughs> Shut down conversation and it's been something that's been policed culturally for me for years <laughs> I, Maureen can I just say Maureen is a queen oh. at like telling people how she feels <laughs> <laughs> in like an eloquent and direct yes. like boss B yes. way <laughs> I don't know how I do that though. <laughs> um, I think it's something that I'm I'm still learning. Um, I think that the trope of the angry black woman is it's definitely still prevalent. Um, I don't really know how to get rid of it, but I think that like you're in the room because they need you, and so I think it's important to remember that. Um, and it is annoying at times to be like the person of color or the queer one or the tokenized. woman or yeah, yeah to be tokenized in that way um, but if you kind of, I mean not saying you need to shift your perspective but if you also think of it as like being in a in a space of power like you have something to say that they need to hear um, and just like building your confidence is something that I'm still trying to do but you are in that room because they need you and just to remember that, like what you have to say is valid and what you have to say could save them from potentially like a shame moisture situation. I don't know if y'all remember that. Um, basically, Shea Moisture is a hair care brand that um, a lot of their uh, clientele, I guess, is black women and they had like this whole campaign basically of white women with like curly or wavy hair. Um, it did not play well on social media, it did not. So I think speaking up is important and um, especially since there have been so many things like this that happen with brands, kind of controversial, you know. Racially insensitive. Yeah, racially insensitive type of like content. Um, they, I don't know if they are listening, but they really should be listening to you. Um, I think that um, if you work for a brand, it is part, I'm just not gonna use this, sorry. It is, um, you should be held accountable and so should they to be authentic storytellers. And I think to go along with that, that means interrogating um, things that they do or do not do. And I think also as a woman of color, we have a power to understand multiple realities. When I walk in this room, I seem, I understand this room as a black woman. I understand how I can try to understand maybe 
how a white woman, how a whatever woman, a man would see this space. But I think that is part of our power and privilege, but also what we've had to learn to do, but other people have not had to do that. So if you can figure out a way to communicate with the people you work with, to force them to step out of their own realities into other people's mm -hmm. so they can yeah. be authentic storytellers, then I think that is yeah. the role. And I think a tactical way to do that is reframing the other person's perspective. So, you know, like I, I remember working with someone and they were like, oh, like Asian American conference. I was like, okay, well, like, is this appropriate? Would you say white person conference? <laughs> Right, and so it's really jolting, or just something that impacted me visually was um, there's a photographer that was highlighted in Oprah magazine where um, he just flipped the script. So it was this black or this white girl standing in front of the toy aisle, and it was all black Barbies, and it, or you know like it was all Asian women sitting getting their nails done, and it was all white women like being, you know, like the nail technicians. And I was like, wow, just flipping the script really helped me to, or it was really shocking to me, but I think it helped other people empathize. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Anybody else? How are we, can we get uh, a couple more? Yeah. Two minutes. Two minutes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple more? Right here. Name, where are you from, please? And then. Uh, my name is Stacey Kaylee, and I am the communications director at the UT School of Architecture, a couple blocks down. Mm -hmm. Um, so my primary audiences are students and prospective students, and I would love um, your thoughts on how we as an organization can provide space and empower our audiences to build community around the issues they care about um, online and in person. <laughs> your school is very white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Your school in particular. Yeah. Um, the field in particular. Um, yeah. I think, I think when, I'm not saying this is what you're asking, but I think a lot of times when people or brands are like, how can we bring diversity or inclusion? And that's not your voice, sorry. That's just like how I think about it. Um, but like, I, I always beg to ask like, why? Like, why? Yeah. Is it um, to sell a certain story? Is it um, genuine inclusivity? And I always, I always want to start by asking why and then backwards planning from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think maybe after the why, it's like, okay, how can we have representative conversation to give people a seat at the table? Because something that that I hate and I think it's just unethical is when we say we want more inclusion so your marketing material looks more culturally diverse but there's no actual like share of voice at the table. Um, and so facilit facilitating a conversation with different stakeholders that are representative um, across the board, I think that's a good way to start after the why. So starting it, instead of jumping straight into like tactics like, okay, our marketing material needs to change, blah, blah, blah. Let's just have like a panel discussion. Let's figure out a way to moderate it in an authentic and inclusive way. And we can move forward from there. And my answer is like kind of short and sweet. Um, hire more black women, <laughs> hire more people of color. For me, when I was in graduate school, we had one black professor, so he had to be my, uh, my mentor. Uh, fortunately for me, he was really, really great, but there was just one. I had one other black student in my cohort. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> um, so we were friends. You know, it's, it's not, those conversations are hard to have when you're the only one in the room. So I think it, it starts with actually hiring people or bringing people in that represent the people that you are trying to help. Um, you can't just have the conversations or have the panels or whatever if you don't do the real work behind it. So if your school is, not saying that you can personally hire you know, a bunch of people, but um, I think it's really hard to make someone feel included or make them feel like they belong when they just don't because there's no one else that looks like them there. And with that, I think also it's also okay to, if you have certain, um, I guess, a demographic that you are trying to cater to or um, enhance, 
I think something that often gets missed is making them the, making them the experts by just simply asking them and involving them. Um, and I think that is something that can make a big difference. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, everything that they said is its own point. The idea is, um, especially for me with representation, I know I recently just, I mean not recently, but just years ago stopped knocking on doors asking people to pick me and I started picking myself. And that's what I told you as well. And I, I, I sense even our conversation prior to this uh, session was authentic and genuine with some of the questions you're wrestling with and what you really want to do to meet a need. So I sense the, genu uh, the genuineness from that. So, you know, instead of asking for a seat at the table, you know, it's, it's building your own table. And uh, you don't need things institutionalized or an organization in order to implement, you know, um, diversity, you know, and inclusion. You know, that's within your dinner table, inviting someone to your house to have dinner, to get to know their story, developing empathy, understanding that we're all ex experts of our experience. So everyone in this room has value to share. So I think it starts with how you treat people, it starts with a conversation, and it's in community. And at the end of the day, community is currency. Uh, we have to understand that. So our community is is worth something. You can you can't trade your community. For, it can't it can't be sold. So that's built with trust. That's built with consistency. That's built with authenticity. That's built with genuineness. Things that are very soft and not very like tactical or strategy. It's it's just being human. Thank you. So. Really quick, wanted to say uh, a big thank you to um, Kiana for organizing this session uh, and Best Practice Media as well for allowing this conversation to happen. And all of our panelists, Nina and Maureen, thank you so much. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Feel free to ask anyone here on stage questions or engage in conversation. We're all available throughout the day and also even tomorrow. So have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you all soon.